Hey everybody, it's Evan and Irma here from Avira Health. Today we're diving into the world of health and wellness with the true industry innovator and thought leader, Dr. Jonathan Kaplan. Doctor, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. We've admired your insights and uh, thought leadership on social media, so we're really happy to have you here. Uh, maybe introduce yourself and your work at Dr. Well by Build My Health. Yeah, I'm Jonathan Kaplan. I'm a plastic surgeon based in San Francisco, originally from Louisiana. So if you hear an accent, that's that's where that's from. <laughs> but uh, my wife and I moved here about 11 years ago. And so I'm a private practicing plastic surgeon, my own operating room in my office. But the other thing I, I started about uh, 14 years ago was a platform called Build My Bot originally. And it was about price transparency in healthcare. And that evolved from price transparency to checking pricing to being able to allow consumers to purchase non-surgical services through our platform. So that's how we got into e-commerce. And then that extended into subscriptions for medications or for Botox and things like that. Uh, and then that evolved into subscriptions for other medications uh, for hair loss or now more recently uh, weight loss medication. So we've gotten very much involved in the GLP-1 space. Uh, and we've also, the name has evolved from Build My Bod to Build My Health to now Dr. Well by Build My Health. Uh, and it's, even though it all may seem like where we are now is different from where we started, it really does, it is, it was an evolution that was very natural. And our, our technology platform has grown with it and uh, really just have a, a great team now that where we're at. But, uh, but yeah, in addition to practicing plastic surgery, I'm now helping uh, providers, not just plastic surgeons, but any provider in America uh, utilize our platform to offer weight management medications and other medication subscriptions uh, like we do in our own practice. Wow. There's a lot to unpack yeah. there and dive into. Yeah. You're, you're quite a busy guy. Um, let, let's start with the beginning. What sparked your interest? That what, what was the original idea for Build My Health? Uh, why not just be a practicing physician and pay back those school loans? What was your interest in this topic originally? Well, like a lot of things, there was a pro you saw a problem and there was no solution, mm. so you develop your own solution. And we had patients calling in. This is you know 14 years ago, and patients mm. were calling into our office back when I was in Louisiana, uh, calling about how much does this procedure cost, how much does that procedure cost. You know, whether it was a cosmetic cash pay procedure or insurance based procedure, you know, how much is I'm going to owe out of pocket. And this is 14 years ago, before the No Surprises Act and before the transparency and coverage laws from the federal government, so. What I noticed is that patients were calling and asking about pricing, and there was really only two ways to handle it. You either would spend 15, 20 minutes going over all the pricing information over the phone with the patient, and then after you told them the price, they would hang up and you got nothing out of it. Uh, or you would uh, tell them, oh, well, you have to come in for a consultation for the doctor to know how much it's going to cost, which would just irritate the hell out of the, the patient because they're like, you know, I don't want to come in and divulge my deepest insecurities about my body for a cosmetic <laughs> procedure only to find out after 45 minutes that I can't afford it. So uh, that's when I realized that we, we need to develop so d develop a solution. So first we came up with an app that would allow patients to check pricing before they came in, but they'd only be able to check pricing after they put in their name and email address. So it was a lead generator combined yeah. with price transparency. And then, as I mentioned before, that after they were able to check pricing, when it came to non-surgical services, we built in the e-commerce aspect so they could actually purchase things. Wow. Uh, but that's how I originally got into that space. Fascinating. So I'm um, very interesting. I'm curious with so many different insurance plans and, um, and different, variations of different procedures, et cetera. Do you ensure price um, accuracy when you estimate this? Or is this going completely outside of the insurance coverage? Well, so as far as the cash pay cosmetic procedures, it was the price that the doctor or the provider had on their fee schedule. So that was a pretty accurate uh, estimate that you were giving for a cosmetic procedure. But when it came to the insurance aspects, yeah, our platform had to be built out to uh, address those more complex situations. But we would be able to do real-time eligibility where the consumer could put in their 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 information as far as their insurance card. And because of the database we had of the different insurers and the different plans, we would be able to determine, one, what was the cost of that procedure? And then because of the real-time eligibility, what would the, be the patient's uh, expected out-of-pocket cost or their cost sharing you know, before they met their deductible or after they met their deductible? So that was all things that we've been we've built into our platform. Now, the limitation with all of healthcare is that because it's fragmented that you could get 
price a pretty good, accurate out-of-pocket expense for an insurance-based procedure for your doctor, but that wouldn't tell Mm -hmm. you what the cost would be for the hospital where they're going to be providing the procedure or the surgery center where they're going to be providing Mm -hmm. the procedure. So that's, that's more of a symptom of the whole cyst of the whole, uh, the, I guess what I'm saying is don't hate the player, hate the game. The game is more complicated, Mm. uh, but we would, on our end, we would be able to give very accurate estimates of their out-of-pocket cost uh, for the provider's uh, side of the procedure. Interesting. I love the idea of the, you know, chat bot working together with the price estimator. I wish my provider or doctor had a chat bot. It would make my life as a patient so much easier, but how does it work for you? How, yeah, how it's so that... funny how providers are so resistant to price transparency. It's like, you know, that's mm. the way the rest of the, mm-hmm. like, the economy works. Like you <laughs> check pricing before you buy something. Uh, but providers are so resistant to it and they don't realize the benefits of it. So let, I'll take it from a plastic surgery perspective that, you know, the plastic surgeons don't want them to see the price because, you know, they might have competition. You know, like you can't worry about that if you provide good service then you patients are going to ultimately come to you. And if they want the low, the lowest cost leader, then they, then that may not be the type of patient you want anyway. But what providers don't get is that when the patient can check pricing ahead of time and you make it clear, it's an estimate that one is you, at least with our platform, you get their name and email address. We're not talking about just having a menu of pricing on your website, uh, but you get their name and email address. You get a lead, you add it to your email marketing database. You can follow up with them in the future uh, if you have an email marketing program. And so they get an estimate, you get a lead. And if the price is out of their budget, you don't waste time on the consultation, which may in some providers cases mm. may be a free consultation. That's 45 minutes of wasted time for the patient and for the oh, wow. provider. So there's mm-hmm. so many benefits to the provider that they just, they're kind of stubborn. They've grown up in this idea, this world where they think that doctors aren't supposed to share pricing. And when it comes to insurance, I understand that it's just more complicated, but at least it's a better, it at least starts the conversation before the patient comes in for an insurance-based procedure that yes, we know you have insurance, but yes, you're going to have a copay. You're going to have, you know, a copay with just the doctor's visit. Uh, You're going to have a copay with the procedure. So at least starts that conversation before they even come in. But it cracks me up how a patient will go in to see their cardiologist, for example, and they'll have a $40 copay before they go in and see the doctor. And they're irate that they have to pay $40 uh, <laughs> because I've got insurance, which I understand it's a little bit, uh, it's a little screwy, but they're so irate they have $40, but then they'll come down the hall and they'll spend $300 on Botox with me. It's, uh, it's uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like how you put it. Don't hate the player, hate the game, <laughs> which of course the game makes the players behave in a certain way just because of how our system has, has ended up. I don't think exactly it was designed right. initially in all the ways, but that's that's what we have uh, to deal with now. So let's talk a little bit more about the admin side and a little bit behind the scenes. How how you mentioned eligibility checks. So how does that um, and also cost estimation lighten the load for the office stuff? So you just talked about the physicians and how their time can be freed up as well as patients. What about the more of a back end and and more of the office administration? Well, it definitely helps there because obviously they're having the more of the conversation is being had before the conversation that they're the patient is able to see that. And it, again, even if the ultimate price is different or that the patient needs a different procedure for insurance or an aesthetic procedure, at least you're getting the patient in the mindset of this is going to be in the hundreds of dollars or it's going to be in the thousands of dollars. So ultimately, what I hope this leads to, aside from patients getting a better idea of the cost, is it leads to a lot less angry patients and being mean to the front office staff because the doctor doesn't always hear that part of it. So I'm hoping that'll lead to a little less uh, burnout from the front office staff because turnover in an office uh, practice is is tough. Uh, the biggest problem with it is that all of this is complicated. You know, uh, insurance eligibility, all this price transparency, uh, medicine in general, it's complicated. So when you get an office staff member that's smart, you want to keep them around. You don't want them having to be berated by patients all day uh, mm-hmm. because- because if you have a smart front office staff, which they may not be the most uh, the the high, most highly paid patient person in the office, that when you get a smart person, you really want to hold on to them. So if you can make their life a little yeah. bit easier from the perspective of the stress of the job, then that's the way to go. And obviously, with the real time eligibility checks, you know you're not having to st- necessarily sit on the phone with the insurance company to find out whether this mm-hmm. is covered or not. They can just do that all through the website, um, and then. 
that not that it's really connected, but that's really all evolved into providing the patients with more information ahead of time. That's also helping with the other side of our business, which is the GLP ones and the medication subscriptions for hair loss or skin care, uh, erectile dysfunction and weight loss. All of that, that, that transparency is helping those patients too for those practices that are more focused on that. Mm. Fantastic approach. And let's talk about your customers and partners when it comes to the healthcare providers who integrate with your tools or white label your platforms. What are some of the wins they're seeing? Any success stories you can talk about or, well, or share? I think, I think the, it, a really great example would be to focus on weight loss medications and the weight loss mm. ma- weight management program. So a lot of providers out there, and I want to be very clear that, yes, I'm a plastic surgeon, but weight loss is for every provider in America. Mm. So, yes, why is wow. a plastic surgeon and weight loss? Well, we had patients coming in for tummy tucks and other body contouring procedures. Their weight was too high. They weren't good candidates for surgery. So rather than turning them away, we started a weight management program. But think about uh, facial plastic surgery, ENT. They, uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors, they deal with sleep apnea. Well, instead of treating the sleep apnea with a CPAP machine, treat the underlying cause, which is obesity. If you're a dermatologist, people would judge a dermatologist, but judge a book by its cover, say, why is a dermatologist offering weight loss medications? Well, one of the most common causes of acne is obesity. So I want to be very clear that whether you're a primary care doctor trying to stave off 13 different obesity related cancers or a dermatologist or gastroenterologist, bariatric surgeon who's using these medications before and after bariatric surgery, this really does apply to everybody. So one of the things that our platform is helping people with, and I think the best way to quickly uh, succinctly say it is that we're PTC versus DTC. So provider to consumer Mm. rather than direct to consumer. So the way a row uh, or uh, other direct to consumer company out there will use a provider as just an independent contractor and pay them pennies on the dollar for their services of doing a consultation. Rather than doing that, we empower the provider. We let them use our technology, our platform to start their own weight management program or their own erectile dysfunction program in their own practice, you know, as for the example, for a urologist or an OBGYN that's trying to treat infertility due to obesity. We let them use mm-hmm. our platform to uh, allow the patient to contact uh, through contactless sign up. The patient can sign up for the program, the weight loss program or the fertility program uh, through our platform, but it's white labeled onto the doctor's website. So it looks like it's the provider's ecosystem. So the consumer can get a text or an email where they can easily sign up for that program for that provider. The provider gets a notification. Then that auto generates once they sign up that auto generates a prescription for whatever medication they're signing up for and that's an auto generated prescription in our system that allows the provider to log in they don't have to go to some compounding pharmacy portal and do all the data entry of the patient information the patients actually put on all the data themselves when they enrolled themselves Mm. Uh, the front office staff didn't have to do it and then the provider goes into the back end to that auto generated prescription, click submit after they review it. And that goes to any one of our compounding pharmacies that we have work, uh, working relationships with. And our system has something we call AIE prescribe. Everybody's got AI now. So our AIE prescribe mm-hmm. is smart enough to recognize what the medication is, what state it's going to, and then make sure that we send that prescription to the pharmacy that has a license in that state. And that also has the lowest cost of goods for that particular dosage for that particular medication. So those are all the types of things that we can white label to make it easier for the provider. So, I mean, they don't have the bandwidth to do all that, that I just described. So that's how we're automating all of this and making it so much easier for the providers to scale their programs. So in the case of weight loss, Uh, I mean, you don't have to just have dozens of patients in your weight loss program. You could have hundreds of patients in your weight loss program Mm -hmm. by us scaling it, making it easy for them to enroll patients, track their charges, uh, automatically charge them each month. You're not keeping credit cards on file. Uh, If their credit card fails, the office staff isn't having to track them down to get their credit card information updated. We do all the dunning automatically. And then, of course, as I mentioned, um, we're we're allowing them to make uh, auto generating these prescriptions that they can submit. Um, and for those of you who, out there who don't know about the weight loss medication specifically, is that you start on a low dose and it's a once per week injection, and then each month it goes up to a next higher dose. Well, that's a whole nother manual spreadsheet you might have to have where you're tracking what dose the patient's on from month mm. to month, so you make sure you send them the right dose the next month. Our system does that automatic tracking as well. So again really just automating this whole process so they can scale whatever medication subscription program they're offering. 
Wow. This is also interesting. And of course, we know the GLP medications, weight loss management is all the rage now for mm -hmm. a number of different reasons. But thank you for bringing attention to the fact that um, once these medications are more widespread, it, all kinds of conditions we don't really think about as difficultly associated with obesity uh, will be addressed too. So that's um, opportunity for those drugs will only continue to increase, you know, up and to the right, uh, of course, rightly so. So I want to talk a little bit more about GLPs in particular uh, and the role of the trusted physician offering these, this as a solution for a variety of different conditions, not just um, weight loss specifically, but, you know, associated conditions. And then also you mentioned compounding. So Talk about differences between the GLP branded medication and the compounding pharmacies. And also does it give physician opportunity to actually prescribe a lower dose and smaller increases in dose, which might actually be more beneficial for some conditions like metabolic health improvements, et cetera. Right. So yeah, with the name branded drugs, you you're, we're talking about, uh, which by the way, this class of drugs, GLP ones have been around for over 20 years. So even though it may be new to right. some people, they're not new, uh, but they've been around for over 20 years. And this class of drugs includes Ozempic, which was approved in 2017, Wagovi in 2021, uh, Munjaro approved in 2022, and then Zetbound approved in 2023. And all those name brand drugs, they're all uh, the Ozempic, Wagovi are both the same basic ingredient of semaglutide. Whereas Mujaro and Zetbound, the basic ingredient, the underlying active ingredient is tirzepatide. So the companies, mm -hmm. they first released these medications that are approved for type 2 diabetes. They found that they also allowed for weight loss and are they're effective for weight loss. And so they got the same active ingredient reapproved under a new name for weight loss. So that's why you have these sister drugs of uh, Ozempic versus Wagovi, same company, mm -hmm. same active ingredient, just two different medications, same thing with Mujaro and Zetbound. So the name brand drugs are wildly effective and now they're on a shortage and it's just that you can't get enough of them. And even if certain doses are available or even if all doses are available, you can always go look at the FDA shortage website to see what I'm talking about. But if they at the top, they say that the name brand drug is currently in shortage, then that allows compounding pharmacies to legally make a duplicate of the active ingredient. And it can't be some quasi knockoff. It's got to be a legitimate exact duplicate of the active ingredient because that's the whole mm -hmm. point of the FDA is saying, well, if you can't get the name brand drug, we want to allow compounding pharmacies to provide consumers, Americans, the exact same thing. And the FDA will speak out of both sides of their mouth. Sometimes they'll say, oh, be careful with compounding pharmacies, but we license them, you know, like, okay, which, which is it? <laughs> um, and so anyway, uh, compounding pharmacies are legally allowed to uh, get these medications. And just to reassure the audience out there, we're not talking about these pharmacies where you can go online and buy the medication without a prescription. Those are for uh, research grade materials. That's not what we're talking about. Nobody's encouraging you to do that. These compounding pharmacies, you actually, just like a regular pharmacy in the sense that you have to have a prescription, but the compounding pharmacies get these active ingredients from FDA approved manufacturers. So the whole supply chain really is very legitimate. Uh, that they get mm -hmm. the active ingredient from an FDA approved manufacturer, then the compounding pharmacy gets it, they reconstitute it or sterilize it, and then they uh, um, provide that to the provider or to the patient. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying we're getting compounded versions. And because uh, they're coming from the compounding pharmacy, they're much more accessible and less expensive than the name brand drug. The name brand drug could be ex in excess of over $1,000 a month uh, if you're having to mm -hmm. pay out of pocket. Because statistically, you're less likely to get insurance to cover these. Only about 23% of insurance plans covers the name brand. Compounding pharmacy insurance doesn't cover it, but it's significantly less expensive. It could be anywhere from four to $600 for the semaglutide or tirzepatide, depending on which one you're talking about. Now, the other big difference between name brand and compounding is the name brand comes in a fancy injector pen. Uh, which is mm -hmm. also one of the reasons they're on shortage because they can't make enough of those pens. Oh, wow. Whereas with the compounding pharmacy, it comes in a vial. So whenever we provide patients in our program, and also we have video tutorials for all of our providers on our platform mm -hmm. where they can show patients how to pull up the right dosage out of the vial based on the concentration, how to do the injection. So it does take a little bit more education to the consumer 
on how to pull this up out of, of a vial, but it's not so crazy to teach people how to pull medication up out of a vial because people have been doing it for insulin for years. Uh, so it is something that you can educate the patient on to minimize the chance of them overdosing, which that would just be significant GI distress, nausea, vomiting, you know, diarrhea, dehydration, things like that. So obviously we want to avoid those those side effects. But in uh, response to your other question about adjusting mm -hmm. the dosage, that's one of the beautiful things about the vial that you can't really do as confidently with the auto injector pen because the auto injector pen just does the injection. Whereas right. with the vial, you can determine how much to pull up out of the medication of the medication. So for example, the low dose of semaglutide, the active ingredient of Zimbabwe is 0.25 milligrams. Then the next mm -hmm. month you go up to 0.5, but maybe 0.5 milligrams makes the patient feel too nauseated. Uh, the 0.25 didn't make them feel nauseated, but they want to go up to get a little bit more appetite suppression. So if you have the vial, instead of going from 0.25 to 0.5, you just pull up enough for 0.3 or 0.4. And it really mm -hmm. is amazing how patients develop a personal relationship with these medications. They know what dose does what for them. They know what foods mm -hmm. they need to avoid. Uh, things that as a provider, I can't always tell them. I was like, this is going to be different for you. The other reason that a vial has become so convenient from the compounding pharmacy is that once the patient gets to their goal weight, uh, that you know they've been taking one shot a week, four times a month, they get to their goal weight, they can stop, but they are statistically likely to regain some of their weight. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we're able to give patients the option with the vial is the switching to a uh, less expensive maintenance subscription uh, that we offer through our platform mm -hmm. for all of our providers. And so what that means is the patient may find that they can not necessarily, they don't necessarily need to lose any more weight, but they want to maintain their weight. So they realize that, mm -hmm. okay, I can take one shot or two shot or three shots a month, and that will adequately suppress my appetite over the whole month to help me maintain my weight. And mm. because it's less expensive, they can continue doing that for as long as they want. So really big benefits of using the compounded version specifically because it comes in a vial and you can adjust the dose like you're talking about. Of course, we don't want the patient taking more than they're supposed to, but certainly taking less they can do. Well, really, really interesting guidance there. Uh, thanks for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the patient experience some more. Um, you know, how do you find patients interacting with their healthcare options using your services? How has that changed or maybe improved the patient experience? And, you know, how do you integrate into their, you know, provider EHR or other platforms that, right. you know, provide well, a seamless it's good, experience? But it's it's good yeah. right now, but it's going to get better. Uh, so we don't mm -hmm. necessarily integrate into their EHRs um, that we, we do so much more than their EHR than their okay. EHR can do um, mm -hmm. in the sense that all the different like automation and the connections to the pharmacy with the best rate. Those are things that EHRs aren't doing. I, I know you can submit a prescription through an EHR, but it's like wherever you submit the prescription to mm -hmm. um, our mm -hmm. system will submit the prescription to the best uh, for the best rate and the state that you have a lot that that patient is in. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely a lot of things that our platform d does that an EHR doesn't. I think the most important thing is that you're not having to do double entry. You're not having to enter the patient's information into your EHR and then also into our platform. You're going to enter the information into the patient's EH, uh, EHR record, just like you always do. But as I mentioned, the patient signs up for the medication subscription through our platform themselves. So the office staff isn't having to do double entry and putting it into our system. Uh, but then, uh, so as far as communication with the patient is that they get lots of emails letting them know, okay, you signed up for this. This is what you've been charged. This is the next time you're going to be charged. This is how much you'll be charged. Uh, your med uh, we can send them automated tracking information when their medication is on the way. Uh, but what we're building out right now is a messaging service between our platform and the patient uh, so that if the patient has questions for the doctor's office, they can just message them directly or they can say, you know what, I'm happy on the dose I'm on. I don't need to go up next month. So we're going to encourage that kind of communication. Uh, we're going to allow the patient to upload their weight of you know, whatever they weigh this month so that the doctor can then uh, track their all of their patients' weight loss trends. So that we're building out those types of uh, communications between the patient and the provider. But as of right now already, the patient can sign up either through an email or a text link. Uh, when they get their prescription is approved and is on the way, they're getting a text and an email of the tracking number. So the patient can track that information of when it's on the way. So we, we already have those things built out. But yes, it's, we're, we're, we have even better communication that's going to be available within the next month, month and a half. 
Oh, wow. Interesting future plans. So just yes. uh, quickly, of course, because you have a lot of access to patient data, self-provided and the other information you 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 pull in from uh, physicians. Uh, patient data is obviously a big deal in terms of security, uh, privacy. So just uh, tell us how you handle that aspect of it. Right. Well, so we definitely are abiding by all the guidelines that are necessary to be HIPAA compliant, as people out there may or may not know. You don't get a HIPAA compliance certificate or anything like that. You just do the best practices. So we definitely mm -hmm. are, are protecting everybody's privacy. Uh, we make sure that, you know, if any communication with the provider, that we don't always CC the patient on that. Uh, those are separate directed emails to the patient if we need to communicate with them. Uh, because we don't, if because if we're communicating with the provider with multiple about multiple patients, we obviously don't want other patients to know who the other patients mm -hmm. are. So we're keeping all that segregated, uh, segmented off. Uh, but that's but we're making sure that the whole platform HIPAA compliant that we're uh, adhering to the best practices. Same thing with our communications with our compounding pharmacies. Uh, we're uh, making sure that those are done through APIs that are uh, protecting uh, pr protecting mm -hmm. privacy as well. So definitely adhering to those best practices. Oh, well done. And I guess a final thought here, you're all over social media, all over uh, you know, various online communities. Uh, what's your secret there? Because most physician entrepreneurs and practitioners kind of shy away from online digital education and engagement, uh, but you seem to lean into it. What's What's been your secret well, there? And what, what advice do you have for physicians to get out there and educate and form and, and market themselves more aggressively? Right. Well, so I definitely, as far as marketing themselves, I think an email marketing database is critical. That's very mm -hmm. inexpensive. And you're just, you have all these patients. And that's one of the nice things about GLP ones or any of these medications is that you don't have to go out on uh, as a practitioner, you don't have to go out on Google ads and start advertising it. Plus mm. one thing, the keywords are expensive because you're competing against big DTC companies, but, uh, but the, the, you don't have to do the Google ads. You can just market to your existing patient database because they are all interested in losing weight. So email marketing is very critical, but as far as social media, I think I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, it's a, I'm a, I'm a recipient of just the, or I'm a beneficiary of the field mm -hmm. that I'm in as a plastic surgeon. Cosmetic mm -hmm. surgery is very conducive to social media. You can show people, <laughs> you know, the operations online. You have to be careful what you're showing. Uh, but uh, so I've been involved in social media since about 2016, as far as showing our operations or Botox injections. So it's very natural and conducive to social media. So that's why I've gotten into it. And then I've luckily got some really good help in the last year and a half of who, uh, of the person who helps me figure out the TikTok algorithm or the Instagram <laughs> algorithm. To, we, have, we have a much better following on TikTok and uh, it's much easier to go viral. And it really is just about, it's got to, it can't just be educational. It's got to be like interestingly educational. It's mm. got to be short clips. Unfortunately, everybody's got a short attention span, but there really is a magic to it. There's a secret to it that I don't exactly. And even if I know what the secret is today, I won't know what that secret is tomorrow. So <laughs> you definitely, uh, for me, it's been uh, hiring somebody that has helped me. I know not everybody's going to want to go out and hire a social media manager. The biggest problem is I would say that 99.9% .9 of the people that claim to be social media managers are charlatans. They're not good at what they do. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. So I got lucky after about eight years of finding that 0.1% that actually knew what they were doing. So I have a lot of, mm -hmm. I have a lot of good help uh, with social media and it doesn't require me being on social media all the time. I don't scroll through. I don't, I don't go mm -hmm. down that, that, time suck uh, of, of scrolling. I just, I do the content I need to do on Mondays. I answer comments, engaging with the audience with their comments. And hopefully they're asking you questions that, that has really been helpful uh, with social media, but unfortunately it's, it's not so easy. What I would say though, is if you're not in aesthetics, you're in some other field and you're saying, well, nobody in my field really, like if you're a general surgeon say, well, nobody in my field really does social media. That's the reason you should get into social media because in the competitive <laughs> landscape is minimal. Uh, and then you can talk about general surgery things that can be interesting that you can get an audience with that. But, uh, but being good at social media, I can't take credit for that, but it is, because it's, it's hard to do. You, you have to get the right help. Um, and luckily we've really taken off on TikTok, and we're, you know, we get patients who are reaching out to us to sign up for our weight loss programs or other programs. 
they and and we're also using our social media platform to direct all uh, patients to our physician finder so they can find all of our other mm. providers on our platform across the mm. country. So we are using that like I like in, like even on my own personal Insta, uh, so social media, Instagram or TikTok, I'm not just saying everybody come to me. I'm saying, hey, depending on what state you're in, go to our physician finder page. So I am turning mm. away business to our other providers to try and help them. Uh, but uh, that's so that's that's the best I can do to help them out because finding their own social media manager may be expensive and hard to do. Wow, great, great point and good advice for folks listening and watching. Thanks so much for sharing the insights. And I learned a lot just in this short call. Final question. You're a Louisiana transplant in San Francisco. You miss the music, the food, the vibe, the culture. <laughs> there's there's Not- a lot of good stuff going on in New Orleans. Yeah, no, I, I love Louisiana. I enjoyed growing up there. Uh, we go back every year to see our family, uh, but really love being in San Francisco. Uh, not to get too political, but I have become more conservative since moving from Louisiana <laughs> to San Francisco, which is a little opposite of what you'd expect. But we do love San Francisco. We're here to stay. Uh, the things you see on the news are, are not as over, as not uh, taught to the same extent as they like to make it. I think people like to hate on San Francisco, but it's a wonderful city and I still love Louisiana. Oh, well, two great places. And still, so and, much still for- and still go back for LSU football games. I still have my season tickets for LSU football. <laughs> oh, that's important. <laughs> go time. All right. Well, and, and thanks so much. You're you're having a great time. You're doing great work and uh, creating tech for good. M- much appreciated. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks again for having me. All and right, thank you, everyone, care. for listening. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.